everybody, and thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Aaron Rosenblum. I'm the Health and Science Librarian at the Portland Public Library. And I'll be your host this evening for this program that's brought to you by Portland Public Library and the Freedom and Captivity Initiative. If you have any questions specifically for me or the library or about the technology, you can communicate with me through the chat. And you can see that I appear as Portland Public Library here. Before we go any further, I would like to offer PPL's land acknowledgement. Um, if that's a new term for you, acknowledgement is a simple way of showing respect and a step towards correcting the stories and practices that erase indigenous people's history and culture and toward inviting and honoring the truth. Portland Public Library would like to acknowledge that the land on which we gather is the occupied and unceded ter territory of the Wabanaki, the people of the place where the sun first looks our way who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. We extend our respect and gratitude to the many indigenous people and their ancestors whose rich histories and vibrant communities include the Abenaki, Maliseet, Mi'kmaq, Passamaquoddy, and Penobscot nations, and all the native communities who have lived in Chuabunkeg for over 3,000 generations in what is now called New England and the Canadian Maritimes. We thank them for their strength and resilience in protecting this land and aspire to uphold our responsibilities according to their example. So now I would also like to tell you a little bit about the Freedom and Captivity Initiative, of which this program is a part. Freedom and Captivity is a statewide public humanities initiative during the fall of 2021 to bring critical perspectives from the humanities to the interrogation of incarceration. Recognizing that mass incarceration is fueled by racism and profit generating mechanisms that tear apart communities and families, the project offers opportunities for public engagement about imagining prison abolition and the redirection of resources towards community investments, the repair of racial and gender injustice, intergenerational trauma, and elder care for the aging population in Maine's prisons. You can learn more about the entire project at freedomandcaptivity.org. They have a really great calendar of the whole initiative uh, that's available in a few places. Um, there are a lot of fantastic programs and events and art exhibits. And one that I will take the opportunity to mention is an art exhibit in the front windows of the main library on Monument Square called Art and Captivity Inside Out. It features images from inside of Maine Correctional Facilities. They'll be on display in our windows through October 15th. And we have an outdoor opening uh, for this and another exhibit this Friday during the first Friday Art Walk starting at five o'clock. So we hope you will stop by for that. I would like to let you know that there'll be a Q&A at the end of the talk. Um, but in the meantime, through this great technology, you can ask questions and add questions through the chat um, to everyone or to um, Portland Public Library. Uh, or through the Q&A function here in Zoom. Either way, uh, kind of preferring the chat. It's easier to find everything in one place there. Uh, we will address the questions at the end, but feel free to drop them in as you think about them. So now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Andrew McGraw is an associate professor of music at the University of Richmond in Virginia. He's the author of Radical Traditions, Reimagining Culture in Balinese Experimental Music, Oxford Press 2013, and Music as Ethics, forthcoming from Oxford University Press next year. He has co-edited two volumes on Indonesian music, Performing Indonesia with Sumar Sam from the Smithsonian in 2014, and Sounding Out the State of Indonesian Music with Chris Miller, forthcoming from Cornell in 2022. He has published numerous articles on music and ethics, as well as analytical pieces on temporality in Balinese, Javanese, and Cuban musics. In Richmond, he facilitates community gamelan on Krong Kong ensembles and runs a music program in the Richmond City Jail. I had the pleasure of meeting Andy and of hearing a version of this talk at the Invisible Places Conference in San Miguel in the Azores in 2017. And I am so delighted to be able to bring him to our community and to introduce him to you all tonight. Thank you. And then if, yeah, go for it. Okay, so uh, let me share my screen. Okay, um, I wanna thank uh, Aaron and the uh, Portland Public Library and the Freedom and Captivity Initiative uh, for inviting me to speak on the persistently relevant 
topic of mass incarceration in America. I'm going to read an excerpt uh, from my newest book, uh, Music as Ethics. Um, that book is primarily a, um, a comparative ethnography of the experience of music as ethics in four communities around my home in, uh, in Richmond, Virginia. So I did research in a Trappist monastery, in an intentional community, what people used to call a commune, uh, in the Richmond city jail, and uh, in Richmond itself. Um, I'm going to speak for about 40 minutes, uh, and I'll show you some slides uh, throughout the talk, and then we should have um, uh, time for a discussion. So um, in March 2013, I received an email from the education director of the Richmond City Jail, um, and there it is, asking if the community gamelan I direct, now if you don't know what gamelan is, It's a lot of instruments. It's hard to carry through a jail metal detector, um, but we did it. So the um, the education director asked if if we could bring this ensemble in to the jail to perform in uh, its mess hall, and I was kind of surprised by this invitation. And I offered to present an introductory workshop so that residents would have a basic understanding of the music and a sense of, of what to listen for in the performance. And in my first visit, I was led to the guts of this building that you're looking at. Uh, it's a dilapidated building housing over twice as many inmates as it was designed to hold. Um, and a staff member led me into this narrow cramped education room in the basement to observe a poetry po program facilitated by faculty from Virginia Commonwealth University, the state school down the street. Now, many residents rap to their poetry. Hispanic ICE, uh, Immigration uh, and Customs Enforcement detainees, would grab a beat up guitar and sing Corrido. And so I thought, this is actually a music program. It's, it's not a poetry program, it's a music program. Um, now, knowing that my wealthy university had a closet full of slightly outdated studio gear, I asked the residents if they would like to start a recording and production program, to which many enthusiastically responded, okay, next week. So I began coming in weekly to facilitate the program, sometimes bringing in guest performers and teachers. And by December of that year, residents had become more fluent in the equipment and software than I was. And my role basically transitioned to that of gopher or backup engineer, occasional session musician. And by 2020, residents had produced over 800 tracks, most collaborations between residents. Now, music's role in that institution changed in late 2014 when residents were transferred from the old Richmond City Jail, what I'm going to call the RCJ, to a new facility, the Richmond City Justice Center, the RCJC, that was built adjacent to the overcrowded uh, RCJ. The studio program was allowed to continue in the new space, but access was tightly restricted to a select population. In September 2018, as I was heading in for the weekly Friday morning session, I received a call from a staff member tasked with managing the studio. He said, Andy, we got to shut it down again. The guys screwed up. What was it this time? I wondered. Since moving to the RCJC, many disciplinary problems uh, prompted staff to suspend the program, usually for a couple of weeks or a month. And these problems always fell into one of two categories, which the staff referred to as cash or carrot categories. Cash problems emerged when residents began to treat their music as a commodity, as a thing that they could own and had individual rights over, rather than as a therapeutic group activity. This led to arguments over ownership and authorship. Carrot problems emerged when the residents began to surreptitiously expand access to the studio beyond those officially on the, on the officially approved list, sneaking friends in when deputies weren't looking, thereby circumventing the system of sticks and carrots used to control resident behavior. That week, it was carrots. The community that met regularly in the basement of the education room of the old RCJ prior to the move to the new uh, RCJC called itself the Sanctuary, a group of around 50 residents who met to write poetry, make music, study, or just hang out. The valuation and exchange of music in this sanctuary 
was often subverted to the ethical norms articulated by this semi-stable community. The ethical meaning and value of music became more ambiguous following the dissolution of the sanctuary after residents were transferred to the new facility. Despite these changes, music was in both institutions primarily a practice through which to declare and exercise modes of freedom within the strict constraints of incarceration. The new facility imposed an almost total surveillance state in which all residents were continuously monitored by cameras and microphones installed in their cells and residents' behavior modification pods. After the move, the nature of freedom and the possibility of free will became regular topics in residents' music in the RCJC. Many jail residents proclaimed their free will in musical terms. So in this talk, I analyze in greater detail atmospheres um, that I describe earlier in the other communities uh, in, the, in the book. Residents regularly describe two types of atmospheres that they experience in the jail. What I'm gonna call carceral atmospheres are this heavy jail vibe, as one resident called it, that they associated with the experience of objectification in carceral institutions. Liberatory atmospheres entailed experiencing oneself and one's life as an open-ended process. Music is an especially powerful mode for cultivating group experiences of open possibility that reject ob objectification. In the jail, liberatory atmospheres were associated with an ethics of sincerity that cultivated virtues of honesty, trust, and acknowledged dependence on others, as opposed to the ethics of individualism inculcated by the institution's drug uh, recovery programs. I conclude the talk by describing this perennial efforts to monetize music produced in the RCJC and the ways in which that disrupted um, and dissolved community within the Institute. Okay. So the contemporary American jail is a municipal or a county institution that houses inmates held for sentencing and those convicted of misdemeanors, crimes punishable by a maximum of one year of incarceration. Prisons are federal or state institutions designed to house convicted felons serving multi-year sentences. As compared to prisons, many more people, up to 30 times more, pass through America's jails. America's jails. Every year, roughly 730,000 people enter the nation's 3,000 jails, and every year, roughly 730,000 people leave, either re-entering society or moving on to prisons. Entire segments of the American population have become habituated to mass incarceration as a permanent fact of life. In many communities in Virginia, the local jail is deeply integrated with policing, courts, parole systems, municipal funding streams, immigration enforcement, hospitals, and schools. Although largely invisible to large segments of society, the jail is a core social institution in the contemporary United States. The old RCJ was built in the mid 1960s to alleviate overcrowding, overcrowding in the small municipal jail in the, in the notorious Virginia State Penitentiary on Spring Street, originally built in 1796. Designed to house 800 residents, by 2005, the RCJ's population hovered around 1,400 due to higher arrest rates and the addition of temporary ICE detainees and a policy of housing felons unable to be accommodated in the state's overcrowded prison system. In 2016, Richmond Virginia's overall poverty rate was 25% against a 13% national average, but the poverty rate in the neighborhoods that many jail residents grew up in was around 60%. And I'm gonna show you some maps with some of these demographics. In 2015, Richmond was 50% black, 45% white, while the male population of the jail, 90% of the total, was 87% black with a sixth grade average education. My observations in the jail conform to Irwin's 1985 description of jails as a particular kind of social tool rather than an effective deterrent for serious crime. Its residents were primarily refugees, uh, primarily refugees of job precarity and dispossession. Many were addicts or had mental disabilities. 
The RCJ was built in the same era and immediately adjacent to the low income housing intended for black communities displaced when the construction of I-95 in the late 1950s destroyed their historic neighborhoods and business centers, primarily the Jackson Ward area. It was built atop the ruins of slave shacks down the street from the notorious Lumpkin Slave Jail and located at the nexus of African-American dispossession in the Commonwealth of Virginia. In their conversation, poetry, and song, many of its residents referred to the jail as a housing program. Whereas social control in Western antiquity was achieved through the omnipresent threat of death through capital punishment, Social control in contemporary America is primarily achieved through the hyper-regulation of life, described by Foucault's concept of biopolitics. Biopolitical management is achieved through the internal subjectification of external means of control. Others have called this process self-discipline or self-objectification. In everyday life in America, this is often framed in terms of personal responsibility. But mass incarceration in America represents an even more tyrannical and concrete form of social control. It relies both on the interiorization of this neoliberal ethics, primarily this illusion of absolute self-sufficiency, which I talk about later, and the physical control of bodies through surveillance and force. The experience of music as ethics in jails and prisons is directly related to the ambivalent status of the prisoners life, explained by Agamben's distinction between the ancient Greek concepts of Zoe and Bios. So Zoe is bare life, the simple fact of living common to all beings. Bios is that form of life associated with political and social existence. In America, incarceration is a form of banishment from the broader political community. While prisoners lack the rights and expectations we associate with social and political life in a commonwealth, they are still biologically alive, and although their lives appear intimately bound by the letter of the law, they have been abandoned by it. Consider consider the systematic and legal denial of full human life, Agamben's bios, to many American Black men who are disproportionately targeted beginning early in life for incarceration, disproportionately experience police violence, health problems, lower life expectancy, and are disproportionately denied educational, political, and employment opportunities, especially in Richmond. As described below, they're often denied opportunities for sonic flourishing. Does America treat these lives as lives worthy of being lived, lives imbued with political relevance? Incarcerated Black men in America, especially in Richmond, have been legally stripped of full humanity as community, that is bios, and are apparently possessed of only bare life. In the jail, music affords opportunities for communal organization and expression, the opportunity to act as political beings and to recognize and be recognized through sound. It can be a powerful expression of bios in carceral contexts. It is an ethical good in this context because, in the words of one resident, it is rehumanizing. That's not to say that it's an absolute ethical good. There are many examples in many other prisons where people are essentially forced to perform their incarceration. Uh, but in the Richmond City Jail, the ways in which people talked about music to me was always as this ethical good. When I first visited visited. It in 2013, the city jail was this crumbling brick building enveloped in razor wire. The city government had allowed the RCJ to fall into disrepair during the construction of the new RCJC next door. When entering the building, visitors passed through an old metal detector before proceeding to a molded plastic bench in the cramped waiting area. Although this area was at ground level, I often felt as if I was deep underground. The heavy thud of large metal doors swinging shut and of men walking in line, the constant clanging of Joliet keys and chains. Some men were still placed in leg chains at the time. Large, loud fans. There was no air conditioning. Unending chatter and shouting all combined into a constant dull roar. Only the mess hall was consistently quiet. Its metal tables and chairs were bolted to the floor in rows like pews, facing forward to a sign on the wall that read, no loud talking 
with the word loud, sorry, with the word talking scratched out. Residents in the RCJ lived in the communal in communal tiers rather than cells. Pairs of residents were assigned to bunk beds, sometimes with a third person sleeping on a mattress on the floor. The tiers were acoustically open spaces with several barred windows opening to the exterior and a long barred wall opening to an internal hallway, allowing residents in different tiers to communicate through the space. During my visits, the education director would lead me through a series of barred doors through this middle space into the facility's basement. We would dodge pools of foul smelling liquid leaking from overhead plumbing before reaching the heavy door that opened into the narrow education room that the residents called the sanctuary. This space was crammed with bookshelves and outmoded computers, its walls covered in poetry, artwork, collage, and photographs. Besides offering GED programs and workplace certif certifications, the sanctuary hosted workshops in drawing, yoga, Zen meditation, poetry, and sponsored, sponsored a documentary and lecture series. These perks seemed to bewilder and annoy staff who viewed the function of incarceration as punitive rather than as a form of rehabilitation. Members of the sanctuary always added a comma before the word sanctuary indicating a breath mark. On the sign taped, the, taped to the door, it was comma sanctuary. According to one of the residents, this means that we should breathe, take a moment to be mindful and intentional in our actions before entering this community. In a community of, appro of approximately 1300 residents, only a select few at most 40 at a time could be accommodated in the sanctuary's narrow room. Violent residents and those in isolated confinement to the whole were administratively barred and the sanctuary fostered its own coterie of trustees trustworthy and often long-term residents of the jail who would identify potential new sanctuary members and help acculturate them into its practices. Sometimes the sanctuary hosted organized activities, but often it was simply a place to be left alone, to read, to quietly socialize, or to, in one member's words, hunker down and not think about heroin. It also served as a space to care for those suffering from withdrawal, a quiet space to shiver on the floor. Many residents described the sanctuary as a safe, free space where they could speak their mind without fear or retribution or snitching, a space in which one could be left alone to participate or not in its activities. The sanctuary offered the full, the opportunity for a full, albeit temporary, possession of the self. That community established an ethical life on its own terms, distinct from the rules and the control of the official administration. In most carceral contexts, there are two somewhat independent ethical systems, norms that the residents themselves establish and the rules imposed by the institution and the state. In many jails and prisons, it can be difficult for new residents to know what is right or wrong in the eyes of the administration, yet they may be punished for infractions anyway. The confusing and constantly shifting list of rules, guidelines, and policies at the Richmond City Jail meant that violence and punishment are law. This is a Kafkaesque world in which minor gestures or forgetfulness can bring extreme consequences. For instance, officially, I am not allowed to physically touch any of the residents, and I should maintain a distance of five feet between myself and any resident. But this is physically impossible in the jail's crowded spaces. Black residents express their equality and human humanity amongst themselves and their appreciation of my time with elaborate dap handshakes. And we know that if it wants, the administration can punish both residents and volunteers for such interactions. Swearing is officially disallowed, but everyone knows that it's crucial in hip hop, the main genre performed and recorded in the jail. So it's generally, but not always, allowed in our studio. Allowing swearing in music is part of this complex economy of carrots and sticks, regulating interactions between residents and staff. But official rules can always shift without warning, and so engaging in these activities always carries some level of risk. Music was performed in various forms in the old RCJ prior to the establishment of the Sanctuary Studio. For years, the institution's religious services hosted a gospel choir, and impromptu rap was sometimes performed on the tiers. In the sanctuary's long-running poetry workshops, Hispanic residents often sang their, po uh, their poems with the accompaniment of a guitar. 
But because it incorporated easy to learn software preloaded with hundreds of samples and loops and beats, the Sanctuary Studio provided a musical outlet to a wider community beyond those with technical training in instrumental performance or singing. Very few black residents had ever participated in school music programs or received formal musical lessons, whereas a higher percentage of white men had basic guitar or keyboard skills, and they often helped each other out across racial barriers uh, in the studio, which is, which is unusual. In the RCJ, the sanctuary community decided to extend access to the studio equipment to all members of the community. But because the sanctuary space itself could only hold around 40 people at a time, it meant that only around 6% of the total jail population had access to the studio. Theoretically, any of the residents could get access to the studio by becoming a member of the sanctuary, barring violent residents. But because of the open construction of the old jail, even those not physically in the sanctuary could hear the music being produced and played within it, as sounds from the studio wafted up through the dormitory tiers. By December 2013, the community had collaboratively drafted a music manifesto. I'll show it to you here. I'm not gonna read it, you can read it on your own. And this manifesto outlined their shared intentions and differentiated their musical activities from their active poetry program. For sanctuary members, entering the jail often entailed the separation from communities associated with gangs, prostitution, and drugs. Despite their violent, abusive, and dangerous nature, these were communities nonetheless. The sanctuary offered the opportunity for a positive community in an otherwise deeply alienating environment. In the context of extremely limited private property in which everyone wears the same uniform, sleeps, eats, defecates within view of up to a hundred others, music becomes a means to distinguish oneself as an individual and as a member of particular communities. Within this context, music appeared to afford special forms of community making that other forms of expression did not. According to one of the members, things that residents won't talk about, they'll sing about. One released participant explained that, quote, in the sanctuary, there was a sense of creative unity. It was amazing support, and it had this therapeutic value. And those that learned the music software had this special responsibility to the other members. We had to learn to support and coach one another. So many of the most popular tracks produced in the sanctuary embodied a kind of political theory for imagining social alternatives and, and future communities. So I'll show you the lyrics for a couple of them. A Dream and A Diamond in the Rough were two of the most popular tracks in this vein. Again, I'm not going to read through it. You can feel free to read on your own. In both tracks, sanctuary members rap about the precariousness of life in the urban ghetto, and, the, and they challenge the generalized social weakness and moral inferiority that the criminal justice system assigns to them. In their lyrics, they struggle to maintain a vision of a true community in the face of the fatalism that many have developed as a coping mechanism. In A Dream, composed immediately following the acquittal of George Zimmerman, the artist considers the ambiguous aftermath of the civil rights movement, suggesting that American society is not a true democracy. He appeals for reconciliation between Christianity and Islam, a pretty fraught proposal within the context of tensions in the jail between Christian themed recovery programs and Nation of Islam uh, folks in the jail. In A Diamond in the Rough, another resident riffs on the ways in which incarceration modulates in a resident's sense of time, the ways in which time may seem to slow or stop or even move backwards in a jail. He likens the bunk beds on the tiers to the blocks of public housing project, projects. He refers to this as project mattress. He portrays the contemporary politicized racial tensions as, and this is in 2013, right? Um, politicized racial tensions as a regressive rewinding of civil rights era gains as seen in police violence and changes to voting policy. These pieces were again, composed in 2014 before the police killings of many more black men and women that precipitated the riots of 2020. 
For the philosopher Ernst Bloch, music represented the most potent vehicle for communicating and anticipating an ethical community, what he called a concrete utopia, as opposed to the merely wishful or playful abstract utopias of social theorists and novelists. He really felt that making music brought these communities into being, concretely, not just in the imagination. Within incarcerated context, music can embody this anticipatory consciousness of possible concrete utopias. More than a compensation for present, injust present injustices, Bloch argued that music can catalyze new communities that enact shared ethics based upon a common good. For a time, the sanctuary and the old RCJ appeared to realize such an anticipatory consciousness. Its artists and musicians educated sanctuary members to desire and demand more and better from the world, a world in which value itself was reimagined. Sanctuary members valued music and musical activities that they perceived to align with their ethics, and they knew, even if implicitly, when it did not align with their ethics. Music can coalesce communal sentiment through a shared sense of its feeling wrong, or being inappropriate, or when it is used or exchanged in ways felt to be harmful. Without explicitly espousing anti-materialist or feminist ideals, the sanctuary community often censured through lack of praise and, and disinterest music with hyper-materialistic or misogynistic lyrics. Within the monastic context, Thomas Merton argued that full personhood, again, Agamben's bios, demands the freedom to give oneself fully to one's community. In the jail, music represented one of the few contexts through which to express that freedom. But music was also a means through which to demonstrate forms of self-discipline, self-reform, and self-inspection. When residents sang and rapped about getting straight, getting independent, being on their own, going to work on time, getting checks, from formal employment rather than cash, from illicit hustling. They demonstrated their internalization of virtues of absolute self-sufficiency, demanded by the jail administration and society at large. In their lyrics, many worked out the double bind that society holds out to them, that they cannot not want a job, that they cannot find anyway. Through poetry, lyrics, and the creeds uttered in recovery programs, Residents perform this self-objectification demanded by life on the outside, demonstrating their preparedness for mainstream freedom and redemption back into capitalism. So now a shift, <clears throat> the Richmond City Justice Center. In response to a Center for Disease Control report suggesting that overcrowding in the old RCJ represented an existential threat to its population, <clears throat> the city approved the construction of a cutting edge new facility the Richmond City Justice Center in 2011. Prior to the move into the new space in late 2014, early 2015, residents expressed their anxiety and fears of the potential loss of the sanctuary. No Just Us, which I think is a play on a lyric in a D'Angelo track. D'Angelo's from Richmond and actually spent time in the Richmond City Jail. The track No Justice uh, summarized the community's concerns. Playing on the sonic similarity between justice and just us, the artist binds the sanctuary community to the shared pain of incarceration and the contradictions between rhetoric and reality, the Justice Center. The RCJC built adjacent to the old RCJ and designed to accommodate 1,300 residents replaced overcrowded tier housing with several triangular behavior modification pods staffed by a deputy at a touch screen or remotely in another, from another room. The RCJC is a properly neoliberal facility shaped by the massive changes in technology, society, labor, incarceration, surveillance that America has experienced since the old RCJ was constructed in the 1960s. New technologies in the facility mirror the increased social panopticism of outside life described by the sociologist Louis Wacan as a society of continual and perpetual punitive surveillance in which there's a blurring between law enforcement, urban planning and architecture. The RCJC's shining lobby features five large flat screen monitors, 
often playing pr uh, police procedurals like uh, CSI and is virtually indistingu indistinguishable from a contemporary American airport terminal. All spaces are continually monitored through video and audio surveillance devices, data from which is stored on hard drive. Staff members were unsure exactly how many cameras were even in the facility, but many agreed that the number was between eight to 900. Residents and staff believed that, surveillance, that the surveillance system employed software running behavior matching algorithms. Although I was unable to verify these claims, the belief that such technology is in place accomplishes the same objective of self-surveillance. Now I'm gonna talk about this idea of, of atmospheres again. Following the move to the RCJC, we installed the music studio in this new education room on the sixth or the recovery floor. And from their position behind the microphone, residents would look out the windows of the Shaco bottom area of the city, which is this flood plain for the adjacent James River. 160 years ago, this area was home to the second largest slave market in the world, second only to New Orleans, which bought many of its slaves from Richmond. So in Richmond, they say the phrase sold down the river refers to that transaction. There are lots of histories of that phrase, but that's how people think about it here. <clears throat> Looking to the south, residents could see the site of the infamous Lumpkin slave jail. The RCJ C had been constructed on the site of formal, former slave shacks. And looking to the east, residents could see one of the many low-income housing developments built in the 60s to uh, manage African-American communities displaced by I-95. And many of the residents of the jail came from, from that uh, part of town. The sounds of traffic, police sirens, trains wafting up from Shaco Bottom could be heard in the facilities through the facility's sealed external windows. Gunfire was occasionally heard from the direction of the housing projects. Directly above them, mounted in the ceiling of the studio, residents at the microphone could see one of the ubiquitous surveillance units installed throughout the facility. These included a camera, microphone, and a small red LED light that the residents um, called the eye. These units, in addition to a speaker, were installed in each cell, allowing staff sitting at a computer on another floor to surveil and regulate students. Uh, students. Oh, residents. Um, a long row of windows on the opposite side of the education room faced a central hallway constantly patrolled by armed deputies. Their shouts often bled through the windows as did the sound of automated doors to the residents' behavioral modification pods, which included up to 50 cells each. We're looking at one right now. According to several residents, the atmosphere of the studio space interrupted their flow when they attempted to record their music. They couldn't get into the beat, and we asked if we could find an alternate space for the studio. A sympathetic staff member located a small, unused office space separated from the loud hallway by an intermediate room. The new studio space didn't have windows or, as far as we could tell, any surveillance units. External sounds were strongly muted by the thick walls, and while to me this tight cinder block square seemed suffocating and alienating. For many residents, it became this space often uh, infused with a, what they would call a magical atmosphere, in which they could lay down their tracks free from the sound of being in a jail, free from obvious surveillance. The colloquial English term atmosphere typically describes the sense of shared feeling in a particular time or place. While jail residents likely experience many kinds of atmospheres during their incarceration, they typically describe to me two main types, which I describe as carceral atmospheres or liberatory atmospheres. For many residents, music could model the ethical social interactions, uh, could model ethical social interactions and was often associated with liberatory atmospheres. That's my term, right? They had lots of terms for that. In this context, our emotions in an atmosphere are what philosophers call intentional. They are about, they are our feelings about this community in this particular time and place. I frequently heard participants describe these uplifting atmospheres that they would experience in the studio as the antithesis of the uh, heavy jail vibe that they would experience out uh, in the everyday life in the jail. 
both kinds of atmosphere can be experienced outside of the jail facility itself. So the carceral atmosphere was often described as extending beyond the jail walls. It could be felt in Richmond's heavily policed housing projects, the dilapidated schools equipped with metal detect detectors and in surveilled public spaces. For many residents, the experience of near total surveillance and constraint during their physical incarceration seemed to imbue the experience of music with a really strong, effective, and emotional power. When catalyzed by music, liberatory atmospheres were associated with this ethics, what I'm calling an ethics of sincerity, in which community was fostered through the sincere consonance of one's thoughts, feelings, and actions, where you didn't have to play the mind games that you had to play back on the pod. Carceral atmospheres index a long history of racialized oppression involving the objectification of African-American lives to the status of mere bodies, right? Again, Agamben's Zoe. This includes, we know this history, right? It includes the theft, enslavement, sale, commoditization of black bodies and the postbellum maintenance of a structural racialized underclass through Jim Crow laws, mass incarceration, police surveillance. As described by jail residents, carceral atmospheres produce the feeling of being a surveilled, controlled thing, an object whose future is predetermined. Many residents were told that tattooing was prohibited in the jail because it was a form of damaging state property. Liberatory atmospheres embody a long tradition of Black aesthetic rejection of forms of, of oppression and objectification. So reified social structures and forms of objectifying control, either totalitarian or utopian, are intended to produce inevitable results. But liberatory social change doesn't emerges not from absolute predetermined structures or carceral logics or blueprints, but from the possibilities afforded by playful partial constraints, right? The way we put music together. In the jail, the musical experiences associated with liberatory atmospheres modeled the loose constraints appropriate for exploring and achieving the good life in a, in a commonwealth. As described by jail residents, these atmospheres often produce the feeling of indeterminate open-ended futures. Liberatory atmospheres were not symbols of some preconceived idealized social order, but active and world disclosive processes shifting experience from inevitability, it's going to be this way because it's always been this way, to possibility. So I'm gonna talk in a bit more detail about what carceral atmospheres were like concretely and liberatory atmospheres were like in the RCJC. So carceral atmospheres. The RCJC's cement and metal surfaces reflected sounds continuously. Because of the difficulty of locating their sources, these sounds, these constant sounds could produce an engulfing sense of disorientation and fear. Quote, it seems as if an, atta an attack could come from any direction, according to one of the residents. Many residents described the sound of the pneumatic locks on their cell doors as the facility's distinguishing sonority. As the doors automatically open each day in a pre-programmed order, they produce this distinctive and rhythmic fuck, 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 fuck sound that many residents described as haunting. Many reported hearing it in their sleep. These elements combine to produce a kind of effective emotional jitteriness for a lot of the residents. residents. Because almost every space, except for the studio, was monitored by a camera and microphone, all residents knew that any swearing or critique of staff could result in their being sent to isolation. When recording their rap in the RCJC education room prior to its move to that new space, um, many residents reflexively censored themselves or replaced swears, which are crucial to hip hop, with kind of bland alternatives. Um, and loud noises often interfered with the recording. And all of this would cause a subtle interruption and pause in their performance that seemed to occur on the kind of um, the borders of consciousness. And, and some of the performers were only aware of this when hearing the playback. It would sound like, they would say like, my groove just isn't good in this space. And it was because of that, what I'm calling this effective jitteriness. In the old RCJ, the sound of suffering in the form of crying and pleading, singing and rapping and chatter was omnipresent through the space's open tears and acoustics. The wails of those going through drug withdrawal and enduring manic episodes were audible throughout the facility. 
Visitation in the old RCJ was conducted through a row of thick plexiglass windows with holes drilled through them, located at the end of the cramped lobby. Visitation was publicly audible in the RCJ. And during my first visit, I overheard a mom speaking in hushed tones to her husband through the plexiglass with their young son crying loudly for his father. Why can't daddy come home now? And grown men in the adjacent waiting area, involuntary witnesses to this family's intimate pain, would avoid each other's glances as their eyes would well up. And this scene occurred over and over and over again while waiting to be uh, brought into the sanctuary room. In contrast, the architecture of the new RCJC made hearing others suffering much less likely. Visitation in the RCJC was managed in a dedicated acoustically isolated room in which visitors spoke to residents located on a separate floor through computer, computer monitor, monitors placed in cubicles. Residents believe these interactions were recorded and monitored, and a children's area was located just, just outside this space equipped with little tables and chairs and flat screens broadcasting the Disney Channel. Acoustic isolation between floors behavior modification pods and cells in the RCJC effectively reduced acoustic communities to a maximum of around 50 individuals, which is the average population on a pod. And this was greatly reduced when the facility was on lockdown and everybody had to stay within their cells. In the old RCJ, yelling could be heard throughout the space. Suffering was always audible, but so is emotional response. In contrast, the RCJC residents found their acoustic isolation alternately calming, a kind of respite from the endless and inescapable chatter of the old, uh, the tears in the old space, and suffocating during those times when they wished for a companionship and, and an emotional accompaniment, a, a sense that they were with other human beings at all. Some residents found such accompaniment in the music studio. As slavery objectified African American lives into commoditized things, Mass incarceration objectifies young black inmates by associating them primarily with their presumed criminality. Required to wear barcodes around their wrists, they become, as they call each other, numbers that are moved through the space through a series of checkpoints with scanners and tracking software. The effective, <coughs> the emotional continuity between the historical transformation from slavery, Jim Crow, oppression, and modern mass incarceration was a topic of regular conversation in the studio and was a frequent topic in uh, residents' lyrics. Considering closely their musical texts allows us to, to avoid this kind of facile idea that, that pops up that contemporary mass incarceration is just another incarnation of chattel slavery. It's different, uh, but it allows us to see how forms of everyday unfreedom are subtly sown throughout contemporary America. Okay, so now I'm gonna to shift to liberatory atmospheres to hopefully end on a more positive note. Having described the conditions that produce carceral atmospheres in the jail, let me now describe how residents responded to it and responded against it through music. The carceral atmosphere is an effective summary of the historical arc of, arc of objectification to which residents often responded with vigorous claims to a fully social life, right? Agamben's bios and the possibilities of social change. One resident referred to the jail population uh, as, I love this, as a bunch of Schrodinger cats, because as he put it, nobody knows if we're dead or alive. And I realized kind of slowly that part of my role in the jail was as a witness to their very life and as uh, someone who could testify to it on the outside. So Ain't Dead at All, a uh, track produced in 2017, expresses this sentiment like really clearly. It was recorded within a euphoric liberatory atmosphere that was uh, fondly remembered by, by residents. The proclamation of life in Ain't Dead at All was this rejection of the framing of the inmate as a dead thing and a celebration of oneself as something open-ended, as a process, as not determined. When participants in the jail music program spoke of an atmosphere that was happening, they were referring to the shared experience of music as ethics. Such experience didn't just happen automatically, but they emerged through these kind of loose constraints of musical style, right? Which was typically contemporary hip hop and special social norms within that community. 
So while explicit rules were not articulated for the studio as they were on the pods and in other common spaces by the staff, all participants in the, in the even the RCJC studio after the sanctuary was dissolved, were enculturated to adhere to their own kind of um, implicit code of, of behaviors. When listening to and making music in the jail studio, a resident might smile, snap, tap his foot, exclaim to music that, that was flowing. And this behavior might then be responded to by others in the room and smiles became broader, foot taps and exclamations louder, leading to a kind of positive feedback loop. And this indicated that what I'm calling a liberatory atmosphere was coalescing. This was an amping up, as some residents called it. It was a desired experience. It was a form of waking up, feeling it, getting into it, that indicated that participants had succeeded in actively shaking off the carceral atmosphere that often followed them into the studio at the beginning of a session. A characteristic example was described by a young white resident, a country guitarist uh, from out in the country, in Virginia, uh, with no particular interest in hip hop, uh, but who is helping to produce an older black resident's rap. And I'll, I'll quote him a bit here. C was doing his thing, that old school beat, you know, and it's, it's not that good. His time is kind of weak, but you know, he's really into it. He's getting really into it. He's like, he's tripping. And so like, after 30 minutes, I, I'm getting into it. I'm totally getting into it. We're both tripping and we're in here jumping up and down. We're like high-fiving. Like, I don't even like that music, but we're both in here tripping. In especially intense liberatory atmospheres, residents would often engage their entire body, sometimes hopping up and down and exclaiming. And on one of these good days, one resident would said that music could save your life and that his crew wanted to just bring all their beds or mattresses into the studio and just live in there. Um, and they wanted to get all the music guys in one pod. And he said, there would be no violence on that pod. They never tried that. Uh, the uh, staff never agreed. Multiple residents com commented that the music sessions were music sessions were all they had and that that's what kept them going. And that the, these sessions had the power to change the day, change the week, change the month and help residents keep their eye on the future. In these instances, music engendered positive ethical communities of people that helped each other out, built up through minute musical interactions. And for many studio participants, these interactions represented, quote, the way things should always be. These are often powerful, but vague hints of a common good just beyond present reality. And this kind of uh, evokes Ernst Bloch's idea of this anticipatory consciousness again. According to one of the residents, something's happening here, but I can't put my finger on it. Okay, I'll stop there and see what questions folks might have. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Andy. Um, well, um, I have some questions right off the bat in addition to just um, saying again, how powerful I think that work and your observations about it um, and that role of soundscape in the RCJ and the RCJC um, is. So it was, it was exciting to, for me to hear, hear about this again um, and take all that in again, especially in a context of 2020 and 2021, um, both in terms of, of questions about incarceration that, that have arisen in the intervening years, but were certainly present before, uh, and in terms of, of COVID and isolation. Um, so for you to talk about, they required five feet of distance, not that, not that it was ever possible, which was one foot shy of what you know, we would all be told um, several years later. Um, it was often not practicable, practicable certainly in, in um, jails and prisons. Um, but one question I had, or one thing I'd love if you could expand on um, based on your knowledge is this connection of intention to the um, sonic architecture um, between the two spaces. Do you, have, do you have any evidence or do you suspect that the designers of the, the new Justice Center knew what they were doing in terms of acoustic spaces and I ask that because in my experience in spaces like libraries, <laughs> having worked in an old library that was replaced by a new library, um, 
in my experience, there's very little anticipation around that. There are very often big changes in the acoustics of spaces um, <laughs> that you would expect architects would be prepared for, um, but they often aren't. That is not a comment on the Portland Public Library, which has not changed <laughs> architecturally in the time that I've worked there, um, but elsewhere. Um, so yeah, I mean, do you have a sense that in this kind of panopticon situation where there's a lot more going on, that they did that on purpose or is it just as usual um, changes in acoustics because nobody was thinking about that? I don't have any evidence that they thought about the, um, the physical acoustics in the space. Uh, I mean, it's it, they aren't pleasant acoustics, but I, I don't have evidence that suggests that they that they try to manipulate it one way or, or another. But they what they do in that space is they they do in the sense that they're relying on both audio and visual surveillance. So they they are in control of the sound. They record the sound. They're listening by putting microphones and and cameras everywhere. Um, and that's how they have dealt with acoustics so you can you can imagine designing a, a kind of acoustic panopticon in which you you want to be able to hear everyone in the space and i mean i i don't think there was evidence for that in the kind of classic bentham panopticon they wanted to be able to see everyone um i don't maybe they wanted to be able to hear everyone as well but that's achieved electronically in the rcjc um you know, some staff left when they moved because they found it to be, although it was epidemi from an epidemi <laughs> the epidemiology of the space uh, uh, was under control uh, and it was safer as com compared to the old space. Um, many people felt that it was less safe in terms of violence because they were relying too hard on the technology. And so they, they didn't have enough staff in enough spaces. They would just rely on a microphone or a camera being there with one person kind of in one cubicle, you know, watching everyone as, and I've seen that room as all of these cameras just kind of on a regular tick scroll between uh, every cell and every pod. And if they see something untoward, they'll send someone to it. Um, and a lot of the deputies and, and, and residents felt a lot less safe because of that. So there is kind of omnipresent listening, but it's not, phys it's not the kind of classical physical uh, acoustic architecture. Right. But it also presumably, you know, I assume there was some surveillance in the Richmond City Jail. And I also assume that if you were trying to do audio surveillance in that space, from the way you describe the acoustics of that space, you, you know, you wouldn't be able to pick out who was speaking, you wouldn't be able to pick out um, one form of yelling from another. Um, right, if you- So you, in that sense, yeah, to carry out this version of surveillance, you need to create a space where an individual microphone might get you individual sounds of that space. Yeah, I guess in that, yeah, huh, yeah. Uh, it's deader acoustics and it's more isolated acoustics. Cause you saw that picture of the overcrowding in those tiers. You put a microphone in there and all you're gonna hear is just, you know. Right. And, you know, there there wasn't air conditioning. And so they had these huge fans running and uh, it was just the constant sound was just overwhelming. Uh, yeah. um, I do want to encourage our attendees to, to drop some questions if they have them in the chat or the Q&A. Um, but uh, fear not, I'm not short on questions. <laughs> um, I was wondering about um, the way that the projects of, you know, in the studio um, that the songwriting and things like that um, followed um, inmates back to their cells or to their common spaces. Um, my, my, uh, I would like to honor my late mother here by saying that she started a knitting program um, in the uh, Bedford Correctional Facility in Bedford, New York, uh, a women's correctional facility uh, where she was a volunteer, not a, a resident. Um, and she went through all the things you, you talked about with metal detectors and, and kind of getting through uh, a huge number of hoops just to want to go in and, and do something with incarcerated people um, where she lived. Um, 
but in, in, in that case, part of the limitation was that all of the yarn and all of the needles uh, and all the crochet hooks and, and everything had to be, you know, brought into the, the art space, art room, and then brought back out. Every needle had to be accounted for ostensibly because very dull knitting needles could be more dangerous than other things that might be in the, the prison. Um, and then my favorite part uh, is that they couldn't offer yarn in any of the colors of any of the uniforms in case someone knit toe to, to, to you know, collar uh, a, a guard uniform, um, which seems unlikely. Uh, but in any case, what my mother and the other volunteers found is that they could take the projects that they were working on, they could take them off needles. You can keep your knitting on a piece of yarn if it's not on needles, which is a, a knitting thing. But, um, and then, you know, in their cells, they would, improvise knitting needles from drinking straws. They could have drinking straws with their drinks, et cetera. Um, there's a much different thing going on here with the technology of recording, but I'm just kind of wondering, um, I would think people would be maybe, you know, writing lyrics when they're on their own or relatively on their own, certainly in a space like the sanctuary. Um, but yeah, was it, was it that experience of people wanting to take it with them when they weren't in that space? Um, yeah. bringing back what they could to mm -hmm. the experience for the set time they were going to be engaged in the project in the program yeah you know when it's it's hip-hop producing uh is easier in this in this way because people typically weren't playing live instruments they were writing lyrics writing rap back in on their cell and then bring and all they would be bringing or taking with them is their notebook um but there were instruments in there and i did take them in and some people played them and uh there were periods when people would were allowed to take say a guitar back to their cell now that surprised me because you can you could do a lot of damage with a guitar if you wanted to um and so that 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 sometimes was allowed sometimes it wasn't um and certainly people were concerned if a string ever disappeared um but you know we were we were able to bring instruments in and leave them in the into the studio and then it was an issue of this do you have the staff available to move people around around the space and that's often the challenge right um is there someone to pick me up and take me over to that space is there someone to get the guys off the pod and get them into that space it's it's part of the you know it seems like it's it's dysfunctional and disorganized, but it's, I think it's just part of the logic of mass incarceration is to have it kind of permanently understaffed and 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 kind of barely holding together. They yeah. you know they don't a lot of spaces don't. I don't know the entire institution isn't really welcoming the volunteers, and I think part of that is a worry that people will be talking about what's happening in the jail to others. Right. Um, well, we do have uh, two questions at the moment from the attendees um, who must have realized they could do better than me. Um, so the first one is from an anonymous attendee, and it is, were the majority of resident compositions within the genres you mentioned, corridos and hip hop, or did residents branch out into other styles, traditions they may not have been familiar with? I know my own musical lexicon was wildly expanded the first time I saw a gamelan performance and that led me into exploring myriad experimental and non-Western musical traditions. You know, I would take, um, you know, we take the gamelan in and we take uh, an ensemble in residence here, a, a Grammy award-winning chamber music sextet, Eighth Blackbird in, and I'd take them in. And the guys always loved it. And, and I would say, I remember one, one guy, you know, said, I don't know what the hell that just was. I don't, I didn't understand it at all. I don't, I'm not quite sure I liked it, but thank you so much because it was so much more uh, diverting than being in my cell. I totally lost track of time, which is a gift in, in a carceral space to, to make time flow uh, differently. Um, but it's not like suddenly people were like producing hip hop in, in gamelan scales or something like that. Um, there would be collaborations, um, but it was often, you know, when the opioid e epidemic really took off, there, there were more white guys, in, white guys from out the country who were getting busted in town, 
showing up in jail. And if they had a background, it was more often in bluegrass or country. And we had some really interesting collaborations across like country and hip hop, which of course happens in, you know, in the, in mainstream music as well. Um, and sometimes we've had, um, collaborations between, yeah, Hispanic residents, residents from Jamaica and, um, and hip hop residents. So kind of, yeah, mixtures, but usually within the frame of hip hop. Yeah. Great, and we have, we have two more. Uh, this one from Robert and it is, hi, and thank you for your talk. This might be an odd question given that your study is of musicology, but was there any study of the role of silence for creativity sort of a reprieve from the carceral sounds you mentioned. I remember the distinct difference between the wards at Riverview here in Maine and the Cumberland County Jail. Uh, the silence was really important to my experience. Yeah, it was interesting doing this work when I was also interviewing to the extent that you can interview monks who have taken a vow of silence, Trappist monks in Virginia. I, I got special dispensation from the abbot to interview the cantor uh, who liked to talk. Um, I think was very happy for the excuse to talk with me. Um, but there is this connection, right? There's this connection in Western, um, white Western middle-class culture between a kind of penitential silence and moral rectitude. And I think that comes from the history of, of silence in monastic contexts. Um, and there's a whole Christian rhetoric of, you know, biting the tongue and keeping the tongue still uh, so that it doesn't get you into trouble. Um, and, and the early American prisons were, were very monastic in that sense, right? Silence was really a part of the moral conversion of people in prisons. Um, you know, I talked about that shift that some people appreciated between the RCJC where you could people would talk about kind of losing it because they could not get any silence. They couldn't. Uh, and the suffocating silence, almost anechoic silence that you would have in the RCJC. And I don't know if you've ever been in an anechoic chamber, NASA's acoustics lab is down the road from us and I take students and I you know, lock them in the anechoic chamber and some students find it kind of calming and some students immediately start freaking out and find it very upsetting to be around, to be in such silence. And I think, so it partly kind of depends on you, like what is your relationship to silence? Um, but some people found it really unnerving to be in such silent spaces in the RCJC. Yeah, and I have been in um, not even very extremely insulated anechoic chambers, no false floor, and I am one of those people who find it utterly unnerving. Um, when someone else speaks almost is more stunning than the silence because you are able, if you have reasonable hearing in both ears, to so specifically locate the person. You can also see, it's not a big room, but it's it's terrifying to me. Yeah. Um, but that also, and I, and I wonder, and Robert, feel free to, to comment further in the chat, but you know, there's also, I think, a difference between our idealized silence, which might include things like a crackling fire or bird song or a fan, just a fan or air conditioning um, com compared, you know, what we call silence, yeah, yeah. the contemplative monastic yeah. silence, um, which might include the sounds of making whatever they might make at the Travis Monastery there, yeah, yeah. Um, versus, versus sort of true acoustic silence. Um, we do have a, a couple more. Um, one is made from uh, AJ is maybe I missed this, but how is the music program funded? Uh, there's no funding. Um, I go in as a volunteer. I haven't been able to go in since the beginning of COVID. So I email guys, um, but I haven't been able to go in and it seems like maybe I'll be able to go in next month, but then I've got to re-up all my training, my Priya training. Um, so I go in as a volunteer and I just take stuff from my institution and I can't get them to donate it because donations to a big university has to go to <laughs> huge bureaucracy. So I just take it and it's this kind of wink, wink, you know, and when we need something new, I just take something else. 
Um, so, um, yeah, there's no, there's no funding involved. Yeah. I'm, I'm both heartened to hear that you have found a workaround and said to hear that some, somebody in all these years hasn't, um, come along and said, boy, this really needs, needs our support. And I happen to have these resources here. Have fun. Well, right. Like what, and we've thought about, well, what would that be? What would be a meaningful change? And it would really be, um, a staff line to oversee um, moving people around and getting people into that space to allow them to, on their own, be creative whenever they want to. It's it's one of these kind of threshold problems. I can come in a bit more. I can get a friend to come in. I can get more equipment. That's only going to make so much of a difference. The next threshold is so overwhelming and so kind of bureaucratically cumbersome. It means creating a new job title and salary within the correction system. Right. I mean, how do you do that? Right. And and when you give money, you typically don't have that kind of. When you give the money, give money to the state, you don't have that kind right. of control over how it's used. Right. Um, the which relates to the next question, which I, I have a feeling the answer will be similar in the uh, threshold problem, but. Were any expressive music, expressive or music therapists involved in any capacity? We've had music therapists come in, um, and I'm, I've always kind of worried about, and I've raised my concerns with the guys. Like, I'm not a trained mu uh, music therapist. I'm going to screw all of this up. I'm going to break you. Um, and their response is always like, "That's stupid. Um, that doesn't make any sense." <laughs> We just need somebody to come in and tell us how to do a filter sweep over a drum roll in Ableton, right? Um, it's not therapeutic in that sense. There's, it's not a clinical um, situation. It is, it, it, it is a music studio. And uh, I don't tell them what to do. I sometimes say things like, do you really want the bass that loud? And they give me a look like, yeah, we want the bass that loud <laughs> because bass goes through cinder block. And we, when you have a lot of bass, the guys in the next room can hear you. It just goes through the building. Uh, but they've blown the speakers out three times. So the one reason is, uh, where am I going to get another set of speakers? Um, but it's really, it's really a, a, a functioning studio. It's, it's not organized around clinical you know, studies, which you couldn't do anyway because of IRB or paradigms. It's really like, let's go in and make music. Great. Yeah. Um, and we do just have a reply um, from Robert to our conversation, which is, I think that's really true what you said about monastic silence. It never occurred to me to think of that. And as a person, it's a real preference for me to experience silence. Um, and, and to me that, I guess that says, and I have no place to speak on this, but, but in the, obviously the ideal here is, is sort of decarceration. Um, but if we're going to have these institutions that people might be able to have spaces, both with this cultural connective acoustic environment that is busy and a sort of monastic silence, I guess, uh, I don't you know, know what the chances are of, you know, convincing anyone of that in their design of future prisons that we shouldn't be building would be. Um, but yeah, do you have any um, closing thoughts for us, Andy? Um, yeah, I mean, you, any of this? you touch a, a bit at the end there on an issue that kind of comes up perennially and that I struggle with, which is like, to what extent am I helping prop up the system by uh, making it look humane? Hmm. Uh, and there's a whole literature around that. Um, uh, called decorative justice. Um, and, you know, there have been moments where the, the sheriff or their staff have tried to kind of instrumentalize, it sounds like a pun, instrumentalize the program to make themselves look good. And, and that is a real problem. Um, and, uh, you know, we've tried to avoid that as much as possible, but there is a whole, you know, what they call the nonprofit industrial complex, which in, sure. in a way kind of can, can prop up these systems, even if it's well-intentioned. And, you know, we have conversations about that in the jail. Um, 
and the response pretty uniformly that that I get when we have these conversations is that's that's a pretty precious attitude for you to have. You know, that's you can afford to have that kind of moral anguish about that on the outside, but I'm in here every day. And if you can come in and make things go by better for me, for us, then you should do that. It's it's ethically mixed and we don't like that. We want to be ethically immune. We want to find right. the right position and post it on social media and say, no one can call me out. Um, but that's just not how things work. And I think do, especially doing kind of prison work means being okay with feeling kind of creeped out about part of what you're doing and trying and trying to kind of constantly do the cost benefit analysis of like, I think the goods are this much, but they're bads, you know, and, and just kind of try to keep yourself honest about it while you're doing it. It's hard. Yeah. You know? Right. And, and I'll, I mean, I would just tie it back to, to freedom and captivity. They have um, along with their calendar is sort of a, a bookmark. Um, and, and on there are six steps towards abolition in the next two years. And, and I'm not going to read all six, but number one is closing the, the youth detention facility in Maine, Long Creek. Um, uh, several of the middle are about creating um, better conditions sort of out in the world, investing funding in affordable housing, diversion, education. Um, but the last one is end solitary confinement. Um, so, and I'm, I'm just pointing that out to say that there is a combination of saying we, we need to improve things for those who are in jail now or in prison now or incarcerated now and and we need to end that practice and because there's also a preciousness to just saying we need to end this practice and letting that kind of get in the way of of serving like like you said the response was well okay cool but i'm here now so i would prefer that you keep coming and making this music program possible because it's helpful to me right um, i mean the perfect being the enemy of the good and i think um you know I, you, I go in and say, I'm abolitionist and I want you, Sheriff, to be out of a job. Uh, and, you know, uh, sorry, we have a rehearsal starting in here in a minute. Um, and, um, and a lot of the staff are on board with that. Um, but, you know, it's, everyone recognizes it's a, it's a long process. Yeah. Okay. Well, you have a rehearsal. Um, we're, we're out of questions. We're nearly out of time. Um, so once again, I'd like to thank you um, on behalf of the Portland Public Library and say it's been wonderful to have you um, with us and as part of Freedom and Captivity and um, look, really look forward to the book that that will be part of. Um, and um, yeah, thanks so much. And thanks to our attendees and, and folks who asked questions and shared their perspectives. Thank you very much. All right. Have a good night, Andy. Great to see okay. you. Bye, good to see you.